to do to cover up. CBS Incorporated, Beth Bresson, Matthew Margo, Marty Daly, and Matt Steinfeld are negligent to treat a good, honest, reliable CBS customer in such a savage fashion. Those people are savages at 52 West 52nd Street. Glendora, in all good faith, paid CBS $30,000 cash up front for those TV spots. I think it was $30,000 gross and $25,000 net with a commission. For those 10 spots that were broadcast on CBS TV coast to coast Christmas week and New Year's week of 1992. Matthew Margo is negligent in prefabricating the excuse. They let them, the commercials, continue as a courtesy to you. Baloney. Courtesy to Glendora. Greedy CBS at Glendora's cash of $25,000 and didn't want to let leave their clutches. CBS, Bress, and Margo daily. Steinfeld were negligent and deceptively eschewing the answer to Glendora's questions as to who started this complaint. There was cover-up, misrepresentation, and deviousness, always. CBS Inc., Bresson, Margo, Daly, Steinfeld were negligent in heaping this abuse upon Glendora without any prior notice. This was willful intent to injure. Stringer is negligent in allowing this odious treatment of a good CBS customer, cash up front $25,000 plus tens of thousands of dollars to WCBS TV 1983 to 1990 or of any human being to happen and then to make no amends after his office was informed of this outrageous, abusive and malicious attack. That's Howard Stringer. Howard Stringer is negligent six counts in not calling Gondor after she informed his office of the outrageous being perpetrated by his negligent staff. All defendants are negligent in not putting this matter in writing in intelligent, documented, and mature written form and of trying to get away with oral insinuations, innuendo, and hearsay. Beth Bresson is negligent in allowing malice to control her behavior over the telephone, the audio tape of her attitude, which you heard, and of her words from the call Bresson made to Glendora is in Howard Stringer's envelope with a summons with notice and complaint. This audio tape tells the story as it happened, just the way the Rodney King video tape tells the story, just the way the video tape told the story about uh, the Olympic ice skater, Nancy Kerrigan. Beth Bresson is negligent to hang up on the phone without explaining what is going on. Bresson is negligent not to come to the phone when Glendora called her back. Glendora's speakerphone picked up the words between Bresson and her secretary, which clearly showed that Bresson was there and able to take Glendora's call. But it's just another lie. She's in a meeting. She's not in the office. She's not at a desk. This is also on audio tape. A speakerphone reaches deep into an office. Beth Bresson is negligent to slander Glendora and to malign Glendora and to injure Glendora. All defendants are negligent to deny Glendora access to the public's airwaves. All defendants are negligent to display such arrogance, such rudeness, such crudeness. You should hear the audio tapes. Well, you heard a lot of them. Glendora versus CBS is David and Goliath. If there were any complaints as alleged, Glendora had and has a right to see those complaints in writing and has a right to respond to any such alleged complaints. This is the United States of America, after all. CBS just doesn't think so. CBS thinks the USA works for CBS. Bresnan was negligent to give foolish reasons and to refuse to back them up with substantiation. Bresnan was tongue-tied when legitimate act questions were asked. All defendants are negligent in discriminating against Glendora. All defendants are negligent in causing Glendora infliction of emotional distress. All defendants are negligent in not telling the truth, covering up, trying to run away, trying to ignore the issue, and therefore unable to justify their claims, their actions. CBS Howard Stringer, the executive vice president, and senior, uh, let's give their names, Peter Lund and Joseph Abbasis, Bress and Margot Daly and Steinfeld were and are negligent in ignoring Glendora's repeated questions, who started this, when was it started, and why? These defendants were and are still negligent in thinking they could simply run away and hide and get away with the egregious irresponsibility. Well, they haven't. It's on television, and you will have the last word. You, the public, will have the last word. What, are the, what was the motive, Glendora asked repeatedly. These defendants were negligent repeatedly in not answering. These defendants were negligent in not naming the executive vice president, Peter Lund, and senior vice president of network sales, Joseph Abbasis. Further, these defendants were negligent of botched operations, first to approve a commercial for broadcast, broadcast it 10 times, and then say it was not fit for broadcast. That's good, isn't it? Boy, that's really how to run a company. It's an obvious lie. 
They are obviously negligent and not knowing what they are doing and in collecting their pay for it. CBS, Stringer, Bresson, Margo, Daly, and Steinfeld were negligent in not returning Glendora's repeated calls to them and hiding behind a one-day temporary office woman, a temp, as they are called. That is about as negligent and irresponsible as anybody can get. Her name is Deborah. Oh, we have a temp and we have contempt. And we have Ginny Cat. Hello, Ginny Cat. You must be want to be fed again, huh? Okay, uh, those, that's the uh, cause of action. Don't you think that's a cause of action? Yeah. But Jacobs has to lie, and they have to lie, and on and on it goes. Now, Jacobs makes a counter statement of the questions presented. He says whether a claim for negligence can be sustained where the defendant owes the plaintiff no duty of care. That's a lie. The court below answered in the negative. Well, the court below, Rosado, answered wrong. Glendora states, after $25,000 cash, CBS holds Glendora a duty of care. They may not know that because they don't understand the ethics. And they don't understand uh, goodwill. As a license of the Ten Commandments or the Beatitudes, as a license of the FCC, respondents hold Glendora a duty of care. As a user of the public's airwaves, respondents owe Glendora and all in her class a duty of care. As a homo sapiens, respondents owe Glendora a duty of care. Respondents write, whether the courts of the state of New York have subject matter jurisdiction over a claim existing under the Federal Communications Act. I made no claim under the Federal Communications Act. This is another lie and another beclouding and another obfuscation, and Judge Rosado felt for it. The court below did not address this question. Glendora replies, the claim is negligence, not the FCC. What you going to do, Ginny? What you going to do? You're going to put your hand right in the lens, huh, Ginny? Go ahead. You can touch the lens. Respondents, respondents are trying to obfuscate. Of course. That's what Jacobs gets paid for. That's how he earns his living. He sold his soul. Counterstatement of facts. Appellant Glendora, proceeding pro se, has served a complaint in this action which is rambling, incomprehensible, and patently frivolous. This statement has no legal practice and maturity. You practice law. You go to law school three years, and then you practice, and you can write a statement like that. Big deal. It is childish. It is petty. It must be embarrassing to the appellate division, second department, Supreme Court of the Empire State. At least what Glendora writes is the truth and is backed up with audio tape evidence. CBS has no evidence of anything as lawyers spews forth in this infantile manner. And in this whole case, CBS has never dealt with the audio tapes. They're afraid to. The audio tapes tell it as it happens, so they don't want to face them. Indeed, appellant's papers filed in this court are in the same vein. Jacobs writes, Glendora says, plaintiff appellant's papers were pellucid, honest, and reliable. Those of the defendant's respondent's attorney were a smokescreen of lies and obfuscations. Lawyer Jacobs confessed he did not have the acumen to understand what Glendora wrote in simple, plain Anglo-Saxon terms. Defendant, uh, defendant respondent's attorney writes, regardless of the lack of lucidity in these papers, the essence of appellant's complaint appears to be that she has a right to have her commercials broadcast on CBS, and two, she, has, she was defamed by statements made to her about herself. Well, now this is another lie, and it's pathetic. Any second grader can see that Glendora's cause of action is negligence. These outrageous negligences that I just read you, committed by arrogant, law-breaking CBS defendants. The facts underlying the complaint arise from CBS's refusal to air appellant's commercials, Jacobs writes. Ginny, put your hand right in the lens. She's got her hand, she's going like this. Come over here where you can reach it better, Ginny. Over here. Come here. Come here, over here. Here. Now put your hands in the lens. Around that way. Yeah, turn around that way. Yeah, out that way. Jacobs writes that the facts underlying the complaint arise from CBS's refusal to air appellant's com commercials. I don't think it does. It arises from the, their negligences. Appellant was informed that the commercials were not of sufficiently high quality to meet CBS broadcast standards. So how come they were broadcast already ten times? Right, Ginny? Isn't that so? 
Now here's more mental inability to understand plain English. Arrogant FCC defiant CBS said they would not broadcast Glendora's commercials before Glendora had even submitted a commercial for, <laughs> for them to screen. How's that? This is the second time around in March 1993. Now, are not to be confused with the first time around in December of 1992. Those commercials they broadcast, 10 of them. How irresponsible can these irresponsible CBS defendants be? Ginny gave up on putting her finger in your eye. She's gone to sleep on the top of the chair. They don't even wait for the commercials to be submitted for review. They said, we're not going to broadcast them. Now, this is a terrible abuse of the public's airways. This shows their premeditated, vicious, unfit frame of mind that produced the negligence Gondora sued them for. And Jacob says, piqued by this refusal, because previously certain commercials she had submitted were accepted and aired. Therefore, Appellant has apparently concluded that CBS has become obligated to continue to accept her commercials. They certainly are obligated to look at them. They certainly are obligated to negotiate their, their acceptance. I guess in addition to being uh, negligent, we ought to get CBS for operating as an antitrust, as a monopoly. That's what we ought to do. That ought to be our next lawsuit against CBS. What legal significance does any of this have? For the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, Glendora says, read Glendora's statement of facts. This tells it as it is. In their so-called, quote, counterstatement of facts, unquote, the defendant's respondent's attorney lose their heads and wallow in a wild mire of confusion, misunderstanding, and cover-up. Lies, for short. On this appeal, appellant complains, Jacob says, that the court below erred in dismissing her complaint because she sued for negligence. That's right, and not for any of the other reasons given by the court for dismissing the complaint. That's absolutely right. Additionally, appellant attacks the court itself for not issuing its decision in a timely fashion. Well, naturally, the court is there to keep the law, not to break it. Glendora writes, of course there is nothing wrong with the New York State Supreme Court justice, that would be Rosado, breaking the rules of the land. There's nothing wrong with that. That is what he
Hello and welcome. I am Pastor Peter Stonis here. I pastor the church in Church of the Bible in Plainville, Connecticut. And today I want to share with you from the Word of God. Again, the Bible is God's Word. And it reveals to us the person of God, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the person of the Spirit of God. The Bible is a very precious book. I treasure it with all of my heart. And God has given us the Bible. It is the only book that has been given to us by Him. And it is our privilege to open up the Word of God. And we, as mankind, ought to take the privilege of owning a Bible and reading it from cover to cover to see what God has said to us. Well, today I want to read a portion of God's Word, and we want to study together a portion of God's Word today and find out what the Lord Jesus Christ has to say to us. And we'll be studying today in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament in chapter 20. And I would encourage you, if you have a Bible at home, please pick it up and turn, if you would, and follow along with me in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20. I want to just back up for just a moment, back in chapter 19, the disciple Peter asked Jesus a very important question. And let me read to you in Matthew 19, verse 27, the Bible says, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? So Peter is asking the Lord Jesus Christ, that he and the rest of the disciples had forsaken all, their houses, their family perhaps, their jobs, uh, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's asking him, what do they get in return for forsaking all that they had? And Jesus responded to them and said that they have great rewards awaiting for them. In Matthew 19, verse 29, Jesus responded to them and said, Every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. In other words, Jesus was saying, those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ and serve Him will receive great rewards in heaven one day, and in the coming uh, future millennial kingdom that will be set up upon the earth. And then Jesus closed Matthew chapter 19 with this statement, But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And that statement really goes into chapter 20, because now Jesus is going to give us an illustration of a householder, and the servants he hired, and what was expected of them uh, from doing a, a good, faithful job in their stewardship that was given to them. So follow along with me, if you would, beginning in Matthew chapter 20, in verse 1. Jesus says here, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man that is an householder, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. So here this owner, this householder, he went out early in the morning and he goes to hire laborers for his vineyard. Verse 2 says, And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, and did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out, and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatever is right, that shall ye receive. So when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came, they were hired about the eleventh hour. 
uh, they that were hired about the eleventh hour received every man a denarius. But when the first came, those that were, in other words, those that were hired in the beginning of the day, early in the morning, when they came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a denarius. And when they had received it, they murmured against the householder, saying, These last have worked but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, who have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a denarius? So here, Jesus uh, then he says in verse 14, Take what is thine and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. So back in chapter 19 and verse 30 where Jesus says that many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. Well, Jesus illustrates in Matthew chapter 20 what he meant by that. And Jesus, as the householder, likens the kingdom of heaven uh, as a man who has a householder and he has a big field and he needs workers to work in his field and so he goes out as we're told early in the morning and uh, he goes to gather laborers for the vineyard to work in the vineyard and some he hired early in the morning and those laborers agreed that he, they would be paid at the end of the day uh, a denarius and so being in agreement with, with that wage then those laborers went and worked in the field. And they worked all day from the time they started early in the morning until the evening came. And Jesus goes on in this passage and talks about how he went out a little bit later in the morning, the uh, third hour of the day, which would be 9 o'clock, uh, Jewish time here would be 9 o'clock a.m. Then he went out the sixth hour, would be 12 o'clock noon time. And then he went out the ninth hour, which would be three o'clock in the afternoon, and he continues hiring laborers. And those who he hired later on in the morning, later on in the day, uh, they also were going to receive a denarius. And then finally, he hired some at the eleventh hour, one hour before the day would have ended. The eleventh hour would have been five o'clock p.m. And so the end of the day, the evening, when they would be done with their work would have been six o'clock. And so some of these men who were hired were hired at five o'clock in the evening and only had one hour to work. And then when the day is all done, the householder uh, tells the steward of his house to call all those men out of the field and to come and receive their hire, their wage. And he calls first of all the ones who came last, the ones who worked uh, who were hired at the 11th hour, who only worked one hour, they received their wage first, and they received one denarius. And then the ones that were hired first, early in the morning, well, they were thinking to themselves, oh, well, if the person that was hired at the 11th hour, they only worked one hour, and they received the denarius, certainly we who have worked all day, will also, well, we will receive more than a denarius. Well, their thinking was wrong. Jesus gave to the first ones that were hired in the morning, that worked all day, he gave them also a denarius, the same amount that he gave those who he hired at the eleventh hour. And we're told here in this passage in verse 11 that those who were hired early in the morning murmured against the householder. They were murmuring saying that the householder was unjust and unfair because they gave the ones who only worked an hour the same amount that those who worked 12 hours. Well, the householder responds in verse 12 to these laborers and says uh, that he wasn't unfair, he wasn't unjust. Those workers who worked all day, and those he hired in the morning, they had agreed that they would receive uh, the one denarius for their day's pay. So what is Jesus teaching in this passage? Well, Jesus is teaching an important truth concerning the kingdom. In, in uh, chapter 20, verse 1, he says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man. So he's uh, likening the kingdom of God to this parable 
that he is giving about the laborers. And the point of this parable is Jesus is teaching back in chapter 19, verse 30, that many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. In other words, God gives to every person upon this earth a stewardship. We have a requirement, we have a responsibility for those who are lost and do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Each person has the responsibility to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That is our responsibility in this life, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who do know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, those who are believers, those who are born again, Christ also lays upon us a stewardship or a responsibility. And we have the responsibility in this life to honor our Lord Jesus Christ and to serve Him all of our days. And so all throughout Christ's ministry, presently now, after His death and resurrection on the cross, Jesus now is offering eternal life to whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And there are some folks that uh, get saved at a young age. I was one of them back when I lived in Maine. I was eight years old when I realized that I was a sinner on my way to hell and I needed a Savior. And I recognized that I was a sinner. And so I went to my mom and I told my mom I wanted to be saved. And she pointed to me in Acts chapter 16 about the Philippian jailer who asked the Apostle Paul this question, What must I do to be saved? And Paul answered and responded to that and said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Well, it was that day when I was eight years old that I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Savior and to enter into my life. And it was at that moment that God saved me. God gave me everlasting life. And so now my responsibility is to serve Him. All until the day that I die. But there are others that don't get saved until they're 30, 40, 50. Some that don't get saved until five minutes before they die. But yet, they may receive the same rewards that I might receive for serving Christ for 20, 30 years. And this is why. Because when God saves a person, God gives each one a stewardship. And He requires each one to be faithful to the responsibility He has given to us. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul said that it, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And that is exactly what God is looking for, for uh, believers. God is looking for faithfulness. And so our rewards in heaven, our rewards in the coming kingdom that Christ will set up on earth, will all be dependent on our faithfulness in this life.